This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. When the jury panel comes into the courtroom and the bailiff says, all rise, I know we're here. And it doesn't matter who they are, nobody should be above the law. A lot of us talk about that, but you've actually done it. That's how you also maintain quality control over your practice. Yeah. That's a question I get asked a lot, and here's the answer. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. Your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, we have attorney Pete Kessner. Uh, Pete is a lawyer out of St. Paul, Minnesota. He's a good friend of mine. I've even had the fortune to work with him on a recent case uh, and thought he would have a background and experience would be very useful for the rest of us. So, Pete, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you for coming out. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background so that people can kind of, you know, I guess the first question is, you know, who are you and what are you here to talk about? Well, uh, I'm here to talk about a couple things, and, and part of it has to do with my background. Uh, I started, I think it's a little bit unique for most trial lawyers that you meet, is that I had my start in the insurance industry as a claims person handling, uh, we worked for the second largest truck insurer uh, in the country, handling truck litigation claims, um, then went to law school, and after I graduated law school, went back to the insurer and ran an excess program for a sister insurer uh, under the traveler's umbrella, and that excess carrier insured you know, probably 30 of the largest trucky concerns that had self-insured retentions or SIRs. Um, and my job would be to audit their claims files and make sure they had proper reserves. And if the cases were bad enough, to interject myself and either settle the case or make the decision to try it. Um, I did that for 18 months and then made a career change that I, I wanted to be a plaintiff lawyer and help people rather than defend corporations. Uh, and hung a shingle back in 2003 now and started doing an auto and truck practice. So you've actually been on the other side... Valuing the cases, negotiating the yes. cases, and, and helping make the decisions. Correct, correct. And, and hiring defense counsel, having good relationships with defense counsel. And I think adjusting over the years has changed a little bit because the insurance industry has become more like the banking industry. It's about getting the money in. Uh, rather than being a true risk manager, it's more about the investment side of the business than it is anymore about being a risk manager. Now, they still do risk management, uh, but but they're, for the most part, interested in getting those premium dollars in and investing it. And to be fair, the commercial side of that, the truck side, general liability side, uh, still are, are considered risk managers, but the personal line side with auto insurers, Allstate, State Farm, Geico, are more interested in advertising and getting your premium dollars so they can invest it in the market. And as some of you out there may know, insurers aren't regulated like banks. Banks are super regulated about what they can invest in, whereas insurers are regulated by the states, not the federal government, and it's a little more leeway in what they can invest in. And some of their holdings include real estate, uh, real estate investment trusts, so they diversify their investments and really those auto insurers are making money off investment rather than underwriting. And I should clarify that for you, too. Yeah. Back in 1991, with the advent of Colossus and Allstate, the McKinsey Company came in and audited Allstate's you know, operation to figure out how they could be more profitable. And the end result was, well, you're paying too much in claims. And their, their suggestion to them was you just artificially reduce the amount of third-party liability settlements, and that'll increase profit. Well, how could they just unilaterally you know, decrease what they're going to pay? I mean, don't, doesn't the other side have some say-so in what a case settles for? Ultimately, but when you look at the fact that 99% of cases are, are not tried and settled, uh, it was a very ingenious strategy of theirs because all states, the executives, said that very thing to McKinsey. How is it we can do that? And they might just do it. How many bad faith verdicts are you aware of, Allstate, where you've been hit for big money? And they're rare, right? How many times does someone actually try the case when they offer the policy limits at the last second? Correct. They don't. 
right? That's the simple fact is usually they don't. Now, there's takes a rare person or a very good trial lawyer who's worked his case up and understands, I know I can win, then they'll go, you know, particularly with depending on the state you're in and the bad faith laws. But let's face it, uh, most states are insurance company friendly and not consumer friendly with regard to their bad faith laws. They've pretty much gutted punitive damages on bad faith cases. So for, for all state, it was a strategic investment move. And I can tell you it worked because at the time that they implemented this process and all the other insurers have copied them since with claim software to justify the lower award, right, called Colossus, you may have heard of that. What's in turn happened is they've grown. They're now on the Fortune 100. So, you know, State Farm is the 34th largest company in the world. They have $60 billion in assets. And I submit to you, how big does the bad faith verdict get before they change how they do that business? Well, I always saw it. You know, people would get so mad. And back when I was, before I got the guts to just say, I'm only going to do trucking, commercial vehicle, and major cases. For most of my career, I've done auto cases. And right. I always saw that as they're giving me an opportunity because, you know, here I have all these cases with just minimum limits policies. And... I'm the one that spends time with my clients. I'm the one that knows who's going to present well. You know, I can pick the cases that I'm going to try to get the bad faith verdict on. And the good thing I found with the state farms and all states of the world is, I mean, I probably had about a dozen uh, excess verdicts. That, I don't have the exact number in front of me. I have yet to be able to have answers to requests for production or a deposition of an adjuster. Everyone has settled for well over the policy limits. I'm usually just shaving off some prejudgment interest right. uh, because it's part of the business model. It's like it's like slapping a mosquito. They, they will pay those excess verdicts even if they have to pay out you know, up to a million dollars on a $20,000 policy because it's worth it to them because the overall savings from everyone else who took the inadequate settlement offer made up for it. Well, number one, they can afford it. And here's probably a, a little known fact that many trial lawyer, plaintiff trial lawyer practitioners don't know is that many of the auto insurers have a program in place where they'll guarantee the verdict. So they'll pull the cap off themselves. I know this because I do personal counsel work uh, for policyholders. When there's a potential for an excess verdict, I'll get brought in and represent their interest because it may be different than the insurer's interest, right? And I've successfully done that, have them guarantee the verdict in the case that they wanted to try, and I thought maybe there was some risk. Now, they'll deny, to you know, because they won't let you depose them because they settle the cases after the fact, but they do have programs like that. Well, State Farm, they used to call it a comfort letter. I know in some of my cases they would just send them a, right. a letter. And actually, I think that's the absolute opposite of bad faith. I think if, if the theory is they owe a duty to their insured, they owe no duty at all to third party, they can say, look, we want to roll the dice on this one, but if we're wrong, we'll pay it. You're not exposed. I mean, actually commend them. For at least the ones I don't like is I get the excess verdict and then they file a deck action right afterwards uh, to try to get an unrepresented policyholder to be told that they don't owe anything about the policy limits. Right. And, and two things there. State Farm historically has been very good at that. You know, you've, you've known that yourself. You called it a comfort letter. Uh, they historically have been good at that. Now, recently there's been some sort of organizational shift within State Farm, because I still do some auto cases, where they become more and more difficult to deal with. And I think what they've done is they've wiped out their whole experience adjuster task force and opened up smaller claims offices, some down south, some down in Phoenix, where they're paying entry-level people and telling them, here's $7,500 authority to settle any case, move them along. And those people aren't invested, they don't care. Because if you file a suit, it gets kicked up to another level. The key is in those cases to know that. It's a game. Play their game. File a lawsuit if you think you've got a good case. And we'll get up to somebody eventually who has authority. And, and in cases where there's an excess exposure, they still are good about saying, you know, we're, we understand there's risk here and we're willing to take the risk with you. And I think that, that defeats bad faith. I mean, yeah, it's a brilliant business practice. Not all of them do it, though, as you pointed out. But it's good for us because then we can pick and choose those cases, but you have to actually try them and win them. Right. Well, there's that. And, and, and usually, you know, as with, I call it personal lines insurance, you know, as you get further down the litigation road, they stair-step the money they offer. And it, it may nev 
you know, very well may be not a place you think it's a fair number or your client doesn't think it's fair, but you always have the result to just go try the cases. I, I will tell you, until I had eight or ten excess verdicts, I never had an offer above the policy limits pre-verdict. Right. That happens sometimes. It's rare. I've lobbied for it in some of my own cases, and they looked at me like, you're crazy. We don't do that. Uh, I know some, at least on the commercial side and trucking side, some insurers have done it. Yeah. I've seen, uh, I can't name them, but I've seen, back when I was doing the regular auto cases, I've seen normal auto cases when someone else came in, saw they had a problem, a big problem, uh, especially when they had in-house counsel defending clear policy limits case. They offered well less than policy limits. They saw the writing on the wall. I've had them. But only after I had actually called their bluff and tried multiple cases with multiple excess verdicts. Before that, they never considered it. Well, you know, you got to get your street cred first, right? right? And, and they, they, I don't think they keep track of it as formally, at least when I was in the industry. There was no database that said, this lawyer tries cases. We call our defense counsel locally, wherever the case was, and say, hey, does Michael Cowan try cases? Yes or no? Yes. That's a big factor in the case. It adds value to your cases over time. It's not an immediate thing, but the minute they know that you're not going to blink, right, when they're negotiating with you or trying to give you a lowball offer, it changes the dynamic, right? And after you get eight or nine excess verdicts, then they say, we don't fool with this guy, right? But you're one in a thousand or one in five thousand that actually do it. But I will tell you that when we had the auto practice, the low level, until we got there, uh, until it was escalated, most of the time our settlement offers were the same as anyone else's until we got well into litigation. That's right, because those frontline people, they've employed them, they, you know, they're not what I would call sophisticated litigant folks, right, that for somebody else, three levels up. So my, my suggestion is on the plaintiff's side is just litigate them if you think you got the case, and you'll see as you get up higher through the levels of adjusters that the money changes. Maybe not in a great way, but it certainly changes. And, and I've been involved in some cases where they have paid above their policy limits, and mostly in places like Florida, Nevada, state of Washington, where there's very pro-consumer laws in place. The insurers then, if they have an adjuster who doesn't know any better, can get themselves in a place of leverage where they've made a mistake. And I just think it's smart business to get out in front of it rather than continue to fight. Right. Right? Because once you have the plaintiff's lawyer's mind and its interest peaked that a mistake is made, you know, fighting back at him is not going to make it better. It makes it worse, right? Or relying on the appellate courts. And that's the one thing they're deathly afraid of, right, is having a bad opinion out there saying, you committed bad faith. Oh, absolutely. So it's bad. It's bad for business. You know, if that stuff gets published, there has, you know, because the whole, like I indicated, the whole model of how they make money has changed. It's all, you can't watch a sports show without five different insurers being on all the time. So the money spent on marketing has gone through the roof, right? In, in all state, Liberty Mutual, AIG, Geico, you see them on all the time because they want those premium dollars in so they can invest it. And then they figure six years of litigation in some places like Chicago, you know, I've already earned the interest on that money that's going to pay the little extra on the case. That's why Warren Buffett owns 16 insurance companies. He's a brilliant man. He knows he's getting free money, interest-free money. He uses to invest and finance his companies and grow them. Now, one thing I've always wondered, you know, you've been on the other side, so you know what the reserve or the money the company has set aside to, to settle the case is. Did you see instances where lawyers were settling com cases for less money than they could have gotten? Um, all the time. All the time. And, and there's probably a variety of reasons for that, but that was one big part of my education it's the last four or five years of my insurance career. That's all I did is run around on high exposure cases. You know, my vice president referred to me as the janitor. I'd go clean the messes up and engage the plaintiff counsel and talk to them and, you know, try to have a good relationship with them rather than be something that's antagonistic. I mean, we can disagree on value, and that's what the jury's for, but it was my job to reach out to them and prevent the nuclear verdict. I'm not sure that's that's still out there, but not as much as it used to be because the way the industry has changed the book of business, right? A lot of them have gone with in-house lawyers, more so on the personal line side than the commercial side. 
So what's happened? Defense firms have been starved. There's very few defense firms, I'm sure, in your city and mine that do straight auto defense. And part of that is because they're paying them $115 an hour or $125 an hour, maybe up to $175 an hour to litigate a file, right? And, and in some instances, that's just not enough to run a big firm right. because there's a fair amount of overhead. Right, so they've taken away the bread and butter cases and given them to their employees, which, by the way, might create a conflict. Right, who's the client then? Is it State Farm who employs you, or is it, you know, the policyholder? And I know where you and I come down on that. So that that has changed the market on the personal line side. Commercial line side is a little different. Because the risk is much higher, you know, you've heard all this talk about nuclear verdicts. What's a nuclear verdict, by the way? Nuclear ver- well, I don't know that there's a definition of it, but I think a nuclear verdict is a verdict that shocks the defense's conscience, <laughs> right? Maybe not our conscience, because those of us who have been involved in big verdicts know it happens. And it shouldn't be a surprise to these guys, but it still is. So the defense industry has coined it that, probably part of a tort reform measure. But they're not. If you look at the facts and delve into the cases, it, somebody made a mistake on the defense side that resulted in this enormous number. And, and part of that is the facts of the case, aggravated liability, truck driver wasn't doing some, was doing something he shouldn't have been in the cab of the truck, he was high on drugs, bad weather, speeding. You know, they should know the triggers. And a lot of times they get in there and have no idea how the plaintiff lawyer, how you and I are going to try the case. They get so focused on what they're doing, and I think it's hard for them to step out of that and put themselves in the plaintiff's shoes and say, how's he going to try this case? And and I had a recent case in Nevada that we wound up trying for three days. It was a difficult liability case. My client was eight feet over the center line. Oh, wow. Okay? And and it it involved two tractor trailers from the same company in in. The case settled after three days of trial, and it's a confidential settlement, so I'm not comfortable giving out the names. But it happened in Washoe County, up in the Black Smoke Desert, which is, I don't know if you heard of the Burning Man Festival, but it's yeah. up northern Nevada. It's rural. I represented a, you know, a retired SEAL Team 6 member uh, who actually was instrumental in chasing down General Noriega. And we know that because it was on the news, but a very decorated veteran, um, left his house to go do his laundry and was following a truck uh, who started speeding on this dirt road, dirt highway they lived on. And the truck had product, called clay product, in his double trailers that wasn't tarped. And it was streaming out of the back of the trailers, according to my guy. And he's speeding. He's going really fast on this roadway, kicking up a dust storm, created whiteout conditions. My gentleman, my client, followed the truck because he thought it was the safest place. You see, he passed the clay pit where the truck came out of, where he met the guy, about three miles back. He knew there were trucks coming out of there. And he thought, if I stop, I'm going to get run over, right? And he couldn't see where he was on the road. You can imagine the desert in Nevada. There aren't any shoulders. You're off the road. There are giant rocks. You could blow a tire. So he made the decision to stay close enough to the trailer so he could see the lights until he pulled away and went too fast, in complete disregard to what the safety of my guy, who he claimed didn't know was there. Well, what happens? As he's going down the road, the trucker in front of my client sees another truck from the same company coming the other way. So he moves over. My guy can't see it because he pulled away. He's still driving down the middle of the road, which was the custom there. You don't drive on the shoulder, you drive in the middle. When someone comes by, you pull over. Because the road, the way it's crowned and packed, that's the smoothest part of the road. He doesn't know that. This truck from the same company decides, in his own words, uh, to drive into the worst dust cloud he's ever seen at 25 miles an hour and hits my guy head on. on. And the the physical evidence at the scene, there wasn't much of a reconstruction done, would have indicated that my guy was probably eight feet over the center line because he was lost in the road at the time of the impact. Of course, my guy was still doing contracting work at 63 years old uh, for government contracts. He was doing anti-piracy stuff on container ships around the Horn of Eden in Africa where Somalia is and some of the Somali pirates. And he'd go away for probably four trips a year and make a fair living doing it. But it involved running, swimming, and being still being able to qualify as a SEAL at 63, which wow. he could do. 
very fit guy, uh, you know, and we were able to put together a case that I thought we were going to win, and the defense didn't see it. The so def- what, what is the liability then on the part of the trucking company for hitting your client when they're in their lane and your client's crossed over into their lane? A couple things. You know, very similar to Eric Penn's verdict down uh, in Texas with the Werner truck and the car crossing the center line uh, with adverse weather conditions. Under 392.14, hazardous conditions, the truckers are required to use extreme caution. Now, my client also knew that the road could get dusty, you know, but he's not a truck driver and didn't have this rule that applied to him. So I have evidence the one truck driver who drove into the dust cloud blamed the accident on the other truck driver, said he was going too fast. We litigated that case for four years, and even up until the day of trial, they still didn't admit who that driver was. So we got all the timesheets from all 28 drivers out there and narrowed it down to three. And the driver who actually struck my guy and drove into the storm cloud, the dust cloud, said, look, that guy, the other trucker was speeding, and everybody knows he caused the accident. Oh, wow. But that wasn't the company position. Yeah. I found that through an unemployment appeal that he wrote, right, and a Facebook post he put out there. But the company never said that. In his statement to the company, it was, this truck driver was trying to go out and pass in a zero visibility situation. That was their story. And they also relied on the fact that the police report said my guy was at fault for causing the accident. Right. How did you find the Facebook post in unemployment? We just, I got on Google. You know, I just watched you present at a <laughs> conference we're at talking about you got to mine the data. That's exactly what I did. I went in and Googled the guy's name. It was a public Facebook, and I pulled it down. And I showed it to him in his deposition, and I showed him the differences between what he wrote to the on the police report and what he wrote in his company report versus what he wrote on Facebook and in the unemployment report. And at trial, he was my second witness. Well, I, I impeached the hell out of him with those documents. And he admitted on the stand that re- he didn't admit that it was the guy we thought it was, who we sued, and was at trial. And he denied it to this day that it was him, even though I think there was a company cover-up about yeah. who it was because they fired this guy six months beforehand for not doing his pre-trip inspections and not being a safe driver. Right? And I brought that out in, cro- in cross in my case in chief with that driver that he was fired for that stuff, which he claims was a setup by the company. So by the time I went through five or six witnesses, it was pretty clear, and, and in voir dire, uh, it was pretty clear what my case was about. And they still wanted to talk about the police report, which, by the way, is never coming into evidence. The cop wasn't a reconstructionist. He didn't take measurements. His opinions aren't coming in. And even if the judge allowed it, you know, she said I had to hear how the evidence comes in. Uh, and we were ready to cross-examine the heck out of them. Yeah. And, and they, they took some silly positions. And I think part of that was the defense firm that they had defending the case was a construction defect firm rather than a trucking firm. You know, defense firm, at least having a specialty in trucking. They didn't know anything about the federal regulations. Um, and, and I don't know if they just thought I was going to cave and kept saying, your guy's over the center line. Uh, but they, they didn't. And there was a dynamic between the primary carrier and the excess insurance carrier and the defendants and the defense lawyers. Right, they all had different wants and needs, but the primary carrier didn't even send an adjuster to the trial. You know, so I sat the excess carrier down and said, "I want to settle the case with you. Here's what it's going to cost you. And oh, by the way, I want you to assign your rights for bad faith for the primary not even being here to listen to how the evidence is coming in." And and I had some good help in that case from a friend of ours, Jason Stadinsky, out of Wisconsin. I had excellent local counsel named Pat Leverty, Leverty and Associates in Reno, uh, who are bad faith lawyers, but brought me in to do the trucking component. And between our team we had together, uh, it, we, we were convinced we were going to win on liability. And if you want, I can get into some of the strategies of what we did to kind of refine the case. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking, commercial motor vehicle, and product liability cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. 
We would be honored to review the case in detail, discuss where we believe we can add value, and create a mutually beneficial partnership. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. And now, back to the show. One thing, just a comment I have, I think the, the from the defense perspective, especially on a case where liability is not obvious, I think they're so used to so many plaintiff lawyers bluff, 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 and then take the money at the last minute right? because they're scared to actually go to trial. I think they're used to that happening, and they freak out when it doesn't. Right, right, and and I think there was some of that. And this was a it wasn't your traditional truck insurer. It was a mutual company out of Texas who did the construction industry, which is how I think they wound up with this particular defense counsel. Yeah. And I forget the name of the insurance company in Texas, but I don't think they understood trucking and the regulations to the point, and neither did the defense counsel, to the point where they could wrap their arms around what's his theory. And is it going to be successful? So, uh, you know, AIG came in in the case and had their own lawyer, who was a very well respected trial lawyer in in Nevada, out of Las Vegas. And uh, you know, he and I had a frank conversation after, and he's like, "I focus grouped your case. I tried your case. I know exactly what you're going to do here." And and you know, we we were being frank and had a good discussion. We we're able to resolve the case with them, and ultimately it resolved. But I think I can share, even though the number was confidential, I think I can share with you your point about they think the lawyer is just going to cave. I mean, they never offered more than $250,000 before we stepped in the courtroom. And you saw that, I'm sure, when you were on the claim side of people. Like you, If they had pushed you, you would have paid more. But Right, maybe. I mean, it just depends on the risk. And that's yeah. where the risk assessment comes in. Yeah. And if an adjuster's not there watching the trial, how in the world can you do a risk assessment? Because... I would say it's one of the best opening statements I gave. Jason Staninsky crafted it for me, um, but I made it my own, uh-huh. right? I'm not very good at details. I'm a big picture guy, and, and in this case, I mean, we had three years of discovery, which is really why Jason Staninsky was helpful. He came in and said, all right, we're going to carve all this stuff out. We're going to give you five rules for truck drivers in your opening, right, that they're required to follow. And there was no technology. That was a conscious decision because I would have had to share it with the defense. Right. So I went up there with a whiteboard and a magic marker, and in a life-size metavisual of my guy and his injuries, I put him in front of the jury, and I was right with the jury. And the nice part about that is all those things together blocked out the defense's view of the jury. So it was a very, <laughs> you know, you and them. it was me and them having a talk. And, and, you know, I think I spent an hour in opening. I generally don't like to go longer than that, but it just... I had some things jotted on a pad in case I forgot, but I put the pad aside, and I just kind of free-flowed the opening. I, for me, anyway, I think everybody's different, right? You know, right. you've tried many cases. I can't go up there with an outline and stick to it. It becomes oh, no. clunky for me, right? I just need to just go. And maybe you forget something, but generally, that's how it works best for me. Well, I find that, you know, the problem is you can practice a speech all you want. When you're talk- if you're actually talking to other people... You can tell, are they going with me? Do I need to go explain it more? Uh, you, know, right. you get a feel for the people, and you have to adjust your conversation and the way you do it to the feedback you're, you're feeling from them. Right. And, and so I, what we did in that case, which was interesting, is we focus grouped it six or seven, well, maybe eight times. Um, after we called the evidence to find out what was important, we had this mountain evidence. I didn't know where to go. We brought Jason in, and we just focus grouped it. What's important? What do you want to hear? And we, from that, we, we culled it down to what would have been a five-day, at least plaintiffs, we were going to rest on Thursday. It started on Monday. The judge was very adamant about, you're going to have a jury selected by noon on Monday. And we filed the bench brief and said, uh, that's not the law in Nevada. We're, we get free and liberal of what I She didn't like it too much, but she let me do my thing. And uh, we, we were able to seat the jury and start openings on Tuesday. Um, I've had a t- talk a judge up from 15 minutes to 30 or 25 Like you can't so. even say hello in 15 right. minutes, <laughs> right? Um, so it, so some of the things we did, because this was a, what I would call, we had a punitive damage count that was going to be tried in week two. So we had all the pressure points because punitives, although they were, were insurable in Nevada, 
were excluded from the policy. So there was this threat of an uninsured exposure for the client, who was a corporation. And, and they had what I would think for a company of this size, not enough coverage. They think there was $4 million in coverage, which, which our focus group testing showed if we got the punitive number, it was going to be well in the eight figures. And I just don't think there was that much done on the other side like we did testing the case and that's where my defense background came in when we tested it I played the defense lawyer right because I know how to do it I was able to put myself in their shoes and say how would I try this case and I would have done it differently than this defense counsel did um, so we were able to leverage them and back to your thing about when well, they offer money and the plaintiff lawyers take it they started at 250 and then they went to 350 500 750 a million and I just, that was without me responding. I just said, I don't understand what you don't understand. I'm never talking to you unless that first million dollars on the table, right? And ultimately, it got there, but it was teeth pulling. And sometimes it's a hard conversation to have because there's so much pressure to negotiate, and sometimes you just have to tell the primary insurance company, I'm not here to talk to you. That's right. I'm here to talk, I'm here to talk to the person you're going to tender to. So. Right. Until that person calls me, we have nothing to talk about. Right. But right. it's hard to do that. And you have all this pressure from your referring lawyer, right. sometimes from the client, from the court. Like, why aren't you negotiating? It, you know, and it, strategically, I think you just need to take the case as you find it. I had a client who, what they were offering, wasn't going to do anything for him. And that's the part I didn't understand that they didn't understand. Like, how do you think that's going to change anything? I mean, we had a life care plan of almost a million and a half dollars for a guy who had drop foot from his femur bone smashing through his hip and wrecking his sciatic nerve. And this was, you know, how many seals are there in the country? Not many with his skill set. So it ruined his ability to earn a living. Yeah. And this is the brilliant part of the case. We, we took a look at the jigs in Nevada. In Nevada, loss of enjoyment of life is part of pain and suffering. In other places like Minnesota, not so much. Right? So we had this whole component of a guy who served this country for 25 years, was an elite SEAL, uh, was a hero, right? And I'm in a pretty conservative venue where this guy's their hero, yeah, right? So it answered the question, is the plaintiff worthy? And I don't know that we had that deep level thinking on the other side, but I knew that box was checked from our focus group work. They were ready to give him money just because he served, right? And in my view, I didn't care about liability anymore. Right, because I had this giant pain and suffering component. So one of the things Jason did, he had some other injuries, like a herniated disc, um, and something called Peyronie's disease from injury to his penis, which was which they they said was pre-existing. But there were some defenses to it. They had IME doctors that said, "Look, we're we're going to fight these things." And Jason came in and said, "Just stipulate to what they give you. Yeah, you don't need that stuff." Yeah. Right. So we took this whole part and told the defense, we're not going to put any of these doctors on. You don't need to call them a trial. We'll stipulate that we're not going to put on these injuries. We're just going to stick with the hip and the drop foot. Right. And I think part of me was like, oh, they're like, great, great. Yeah, they where they've got a big victory. Right. Where they should have been thinking, uh, what am I missing? Right. How are they going to do this? So that was one thing we did with Jason's help was really focus the case and get it called down from eight experts to maybe two or three. Um, so after the opening, you know, and I thought it was one of the better openings I gave, and, and I was relaxed. I would, the pace with which I was speaking was relaxed. I wasn't in a rush. A lot of the stuff we saw Sorry talk about. Sorry, right. Belmont. Yeah, yeah. she was a past guest, and she was also did, spoke yesterday at our conference. A lot of that stuff, and we did that. I had never seen her speak before, but I'm like, oh, I did, I've done that. <laughs> you know, and it's part of it is being comfortable, and you got to be okay with the case, right? Like, you got to think you're going to win, or else you're going to be nervous. So we did that, and then I put on the road commissioner. I had the county commissioner talk about the roadway, what the speed limit was to get that foundation laid. And then we had an angle of the case. There was evidence that a cement company who hired the trucking company was watering the roadways, but they never watered this stretch because it was county road. That was their defense. We can't do that. But well, we put the county commissioner up and asked him, what they, could they water the roadways? He said, yeah, with a phone call and a handshake. <laughs> Why is that? Because it makes it safer. 
So we brought that cement company in on a 324A theory of assumption of a duty. The judge allowed it to go in. You're talking about restatement towards 324A when a company assumes a duty, then they have a duty. Yes, sir. To- not do it negligently. But we spun them off. We made a, a decision, at, uh, part of this calling the case down and making it simple. We spun them off uh, on a confidential settlement for a small amount prior to trial. And there were several reasons doing that. You know, one is I don't want to give them two defendants and two bites at opening, two bites at closing, two bites at crossing my guys. So we made the, the decision, like, that's not our target. Right. Right? We brought them in for a purpose that served this purpose. We settled with them and spun them off and really focused down on the trucking company and their bad acts. And the punitive part of the case was the fact that they fired this guy and said he's not rehirable, right? That was an exhibit in the case. And they rehired him anyway? Rehired him anyway. Did you find from your focus groups that the juror pool would know that people drove in the middle of the road? Or is that something you had to teach? I think we had to teach that. We did that with the county commissioner, you know, because that was a question. And, and they had an expert from California who was going to look at our guys. Of course, they spoliated their black box, and we can talk about that next, how an adverse inference, we just punted on it. Because, we, you know, that I think there's reasons to do that, and it's about leverage rather than actually utilizing a trial. Because the, the, we fought a lot about what that instruction was going to look like, right. right? And it was a rebuttable presumption. That's where the judge came down. I thought the jury would think they're just trying to trick us or get something for nothing, so we didn't bring it up, right? The fact that they spoliated the evidence, but we had my guy's black box, you know, from the airbag module, which gave us five seconds of data. And their theory was he was passing. And I bet I stared at that readout, you know, the EDR readouts, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, the Bosch readout. And I stared at it for months. And then it finally dawned on me, my guy wasn't on the accelerator ever. So they break it down in 120 microseconds. He may have been on the accelerator for like three of the, the data you're points. passing your... You're right. That. So that's what I didn't understand. They were going to put this expert on to say he's passing. I consciously chose not to depose any of their experts. Right because I didn't want to give any of my cross away and get them prepared for it. And I think that was going to be a common sense thing that the jury would have latched on to, like, wait a minute, how do you pass without touching the accelerator? This whole theory goes down the drain, yeah. and they lose credibility. Right? We talk about that a lot. You've got to be the most credible person in the courtroom, and I felt like we did that. And a lot of the defense antics the judge finally looked at and said, I had enough of this. You guys aren't playing ball the right way. So you got to clean it up. And, and so I think we won that credibility battle, and I think it would have wound up in a, a big excess verdict, but the number got high enough where my guy could live the rest of his life and not have to worry. And, and ultimately, it's about the client, right? It is. It's not about our egos. It's, it's not. Although it would have been fun when you're in the middle of the fight just to finish it, uh, to finish it and see what would have happened, but there's risk with that. Yeah. You never really know. It's something I'm struggling with. I've got one of my goals is to get a, a verdict over a certain number. It's purely an ego driven, right. marketing driven goal. But I'm being very conscientious. I have to wait till an insurance company makes a mistake of judgment to give me that opportunity because almost every case I have that I'm working up to go get that big verdict, uh, you know, they give my client a decision to make where it's in my client's best interest to settle the case. Right. And, you know, I can't put my own ego above who hired me. Right. And, and listen, I think that's the art of the other side. And there are still some very good adjusters. You know, AIG is difficult to deal with, but, you know, I've had two trials with them now, one in South Carolina and one in here. And their adjusters are very, mostly lawyers, not all of them, but they're highly educated. They know trucks. And they're, I found they're very good at evaluating the price point on the case. And what I mean is that point in which your client has got to think real hard about the number. It may not be all the money they have, but I think that's the art, is getting to that point on the defense side where your, your client's going to have a hard time walking away from it. Yeah. Right? And, and like the, to your point, they know you're a good lawyer, they know you can bring the ball across the finish line or the goal line, and you've had excess verdicts. They're like, they're really on a fool with this guy. But even then, a lot of times they still make you at least start the trial to see how it's going to go. That's that's their that's their MO, right? And And... And I tell lawyers that, and you saw me speak here at this convention, is, you know, don't mediate the case. If you've got a case that you think meets all your criteria for a five-star case, that money's always going to be there, 
right? But they want to get you and your client in a position to get that pucker money out there where it's okay, but it's not what it should be. The RTA just won't let us go to trial unless we mediate. Same in Minnesota, but there are some places that don't have that requirement. I yeah. mean, that Nevada case, we mediated twice, and they never got over a hundred grand. And I, despite me telling them repeatedly, you know, this is a seven-figure case. I'm never taking less than that. Yeah. And I think they thought, because they've done it successfully, is we'll get the client there, the mediator will beat up on them, tell you how shitty your case is, and here's your money. Yep. And, and it's... It's something as lawyers, because we have time and money into it, that we have to resist, is looking at what would that mean to me selfishly, right? And we got to put ourselves in our client's shoes to say, was well, this right for you? Can we invest this money to earn you money? Can you live it off for the rest of your life? And I think the other thing to do is you have to develop that client relationship. Because in my thought, if a mediator who just met my client is more persuasive than me, who has right. had the relationship, then I'm doing something wrong. Right. Right, and we did that in that Nevada case. We went out to his house in the desert, uh, you know, solar power, uh, had a windmill for water. You know, he was living rough, but he liked the solace life because during his life, the places he'd been, you know, fighting for this country, he wanted solace. That's yeah. what I want. I'll be around people. I've seen the evil in the world. I'm ready to be at peace out here and take care of my horses. The interesting thing was it was a bit sad because, you know, he'd been married and divorced three times and had four kids that, you know, he was, he was loved and was close to, but not as close as he wanted because he was busy out fighting for the country, right? So we took that story with the, the pain and suffering, like his life was being a SEAL. His friend group were SEALs and right. retired SEALs. In fact, his work group were retired SEALs. They would only hire retired SEALs to go on these container ships. They robbed that from him. Well, I think the, if you think about it, what we ask them to do is so much outside of normal human experience and then what frankly what they experience i mean they, they we need them but they experience some awful things that go oh, through God. a lot for us uh it's hard i think to relate to people that haven't been through that well it was an education for me to be with him and it's you know it's an emotional case just watching him he was like a broken man right i mean because he couldn't run he was a superhero yeah Right, and he relied on his physical attributes and his mind. And part of the SEAL training is to get your mind to a place where you're ignoring the bullets, you're running at them. Right, and and I think it really shook who he was, and that was part of our story. Yeah. He was uncomfortable with it, but we made it part of our story, and that only worked by sitting down with him in his house and talking to him about it. Right, getting to know who he was as a person, and and bringing that story to trial. And I, in my view. They couldn't defend that. How do you cross-examine a guy who served his country for 26 years as a SEAL? Yeah. Right? They're like celebrities now. And I, I think they misplayed that. And, and part of what I did throughout that case was stay in touch with the excess adjuster. There were two layers here. And repeatedly sent them every order I got saying, this is a bad case. You guys ought to settle this. You've got to do this. And really, I was papering the record for the second trial, the bad faith trial, if I got an excess verdict about whose mistake this was. Is there ever a way that you can, you know, is there ever any kind of tension between the insured, the primary insurance layer, the excess, or one layer of excess and another when you're, you know, when you're on the other side? Yeah, there's always tension, and it's because, you know, that tripart relationship with insured, defense counsel, and insured, and some of these insureds on the truck side are sophisticated entities with self-insured money, right, uh, maybe in the first layer, sometimes in the middle layer. And they're very, uh, they're very involved in that process, the litigation process. And a lot of times it's a lawyer who heads up, you know, the risk management department who has litigation of experience of his own or her own. And, and many times they have different reasons and want different things. And I believe it's your job as a plaintiff lawyer to exploit that or find where that friction is, and, and leverage it if you can. Can you give me an example of how you leverage that friction between the, the different insurance companies or the insured and the insurance company to get something? Yeah, I, for a better I can give you an example. You know, in, in this case, I mean, we had a primary insurer and defense counsel who thought the exposure was contained to X. And we had an insured, and I'll give you an example. I sat down and... and third day of trial, second day of trial, and looked at the excess carrier and said, 
you know what, I, you and I need to work out a deal and then assign the bad faith cause of action to the primary because the primary owns a fiduciary due to the excess in most states. I want that case. They're not here. They're not paying attention to this case. This is a bad case. And she started to see that as I was filleting their witnesses and giving a good opening. They saw what the case was about now, right? right? Despite the fact I've been telling them this all the time. So what we're doing is we're trying to create some sort of you know, break in the communication. I don't like talking to the defense lawyer about negotiating. I told her that. I said, you don't have the money. I want to talk to the money man. Now, they won't talk to you all the time. But right. that's the person you should be engaging in your cases is the person with the money, not the intermediary, right? So I try to cut that out. The other thing we did in, in this case was once once the the day one started, I told them, you're done talking to me. My partner's in the back. He's negotiation counsel. I'm done. You talk to him. And I, there's a strategic reason for that is when you're in battle mode, you want to be in battle mode. I have played the role of negotiation counsel for some of our friends. I was going to say, I know there have been some pretty significant uh, settlements where you actually let, you came in and did all the negotiations while someone else is working on working right. the case. Right, and I think it's it's smart to do so on high, in cases you're going to try, even a small one, you, you want to be focused on trying stuff. I don't be talking about that stuff. I'll talk to my partner later about right. it. My partner, Greg McEwen, did a great job of sitting in the back of the room with the AIG adjuster after every witness saying, this isn't going good for you, right? You ought to think about this. And, and there's another, there's a twofold reason for that. If there's a bad faith case and you've hired someone, whether it's someone in your firm to negotiate or outside counsel to negotiate, you're no longer conflicted from handling the bad faith case. No one knows that case better than you. But you won't be a witness anymore. You won't be a witness anymore. The person doing the negotiating is a witness. So there's a reason to do it that way. And, and I find it creates consternation on the other side because they don't know what to do with it. Right? They're so used to be able to get at the trial lawyer at trial. Right. And it's very difficult. You and I have both been there to ignore that. And I knew from experience, I don't want to do that. Hell, I used to do that to people. I mean, I'd go to trials for insurance companies and talk to the plaintiff lawyer and say, here's what I'm going to offer you. You did a good job. I'm going to offer you X. And it's got a lot of zeros after it. It's human nature not to think about the amount of money at risk. The other problem is even when you aren't taking that particular offer, once you know the case is likely to settle, it's hard to focus as much on the case. Correct. <laughs> because then there's this, at least for me, right, is this idea of I've done all this hard work, boy, rest would be nice. Yeah. Right, that you're in the middle of it, it's fatiguing, being on your feet all day is difficult, right? You're up early, getting ready, maybe staying up late to get witness preparation done, and, and then they come in with that. And it's powerful, it's a tool that they have, and I bring people in to block that, right? Because yeah. I'm in fight mode, and I want to fight. You know, it's like Sorry said yesterday, you're not there to win, you're there to fight. The result's the results. And, and that's what they're trying to do psychologically, is creep the results in, to your mind right. to get you off your game. Put that pressure on you, and get it, you distracted. And AIG's brilliant at it. They are. They really are. <laughs> they're very good at it. You know, As much as we hate and complain about them, they're, they're the best at what they do. They're best at creating conflicts between plaintiff's counsel and creating conflicts between you and the other insurance yes. people. I mean, they're really... you got, you got to give it to them. They're, they're but, good at what they do. But you ask what you can do. You should be doing that same thing, right? right. And that's what I've taken from my defense side and my insurance side is I start to create these avenues of communication that may be doing the same th thing that they're trying to do to you, right? From your experience on both sides, uh, which is fairly unique. I mean, I know people that have been insurance defense lawyer before, but I'm not, I don't know anyone else that's been at the high level in the, on the claim side and then been at the high level on the plaintiff side right. in cases. What are the kind of the top things you see plaintiff lawyers do that end up leaving money on the table that could happen? Well, in the trucking context, um, the biggest thing is they they take the insurer's word for it that there's 750 in coverage. You know, you got multiple fatalities. It's 750. Sorry, here's an interpleader action, and and you'd be surprised how many lawyers take the money. And then they'll call me or you, say, well, I think there's an excess out here. Or there's a trailer policy, or there's other defendants. So they 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 leverage themselves by taking that money when that money's always going to be there. Right, so I think that's one mistake, or they don't know the body of law well enough, or the transportation cycle well enough to know I can go upstream here. 
right? right? So in other words, once you've settled with the insurer, it doesn't matter whether they have an excess policy or not, so well, you've lost that. Well, I've had cases where I've been brought in to look at uh, an excess policy where they took the primary money uh, or another defendant and released that other defendant in their release. Yeah. They didn't look at it. And they didn't think, you know, that language in there that talks about, and any other insured under our policy yeah. is released from the primary, and then you go find defendant X and find out defendant X insured under the primary. You release them. Even though they have an excess. Yes. So yeah. it's problematic. I mean, you've got to be real careful with that stuff. You know, if they're trying to push the money at you, it's always going to be there. Do your homework, right? Dot your I's, cross your T's, paper your file that, look, I've exhausted every remedy known to me. I'll take the money now, right? Because I think you got to be able to say with, to your client with a straight face, I looked, it's just not there. And that happens. Yeah. That's one big one that they do. The other big one, I think, is in five-star cases, they, they agree to mediate uh, too easily and don't get anything for it, right? What do you mean by that? Well, I think too easily is they, they come in to mediate your five-star case, like we've talked about before. The idea is to get a pile of money in front of your, your client who 90% of the case has never seen a, a sum that big, right? Or a trustee for a death case and they haven't seen that much money they're like damn why do I don't want to gamble that right my, my, there will always be time to mediate do your homework first see what you can develop maybe on a punitive count um, and like you said they're always going to come to the tr courthouse with more money yeah and it may take some banging in their heads a little bit at trial to get that there but they'll always do that um, and, and I resist it in my case, you know, the cases I think, and everybody's got their own idea what a five-star case is. Right. But I resist it. There'll be plenty of time to talk about that. It's too early, and of course, they want to get out in front of the, the exposure. There's nothing that drives them more crazy if I want to say, well, we want to mediate, and I'm like, well, I, I don't have the information I need to evaluate the case. I don't know if I have right. punitives against your client yet. I don't know how... Who knew what? I don't know how mad a jury's going to get, and I got to know that to give my client advice. And they just they, they can't believe it. They're like, right. well, we're, we know what the damages are, yeah, but I don't know I don't know how sexy of a case I have. And That's so right. I can't talk to you yet. Let well, me give me my discovery if you want to talk. There are many times maybe they're hiding something. Yeah. Maybe they know a bad fact that you don't know that is a you know an exponential kicker on the case value. And, and so we just so. had that happen. Someone was one immediate, one immediate. Let's get this resolved early. When they get resolved early, you know. We said no, and then we get back positive drug test. Right. There you go. And, and there's cases to resolve early. I mean, there are. I'm not advocating for not ever doing it, but on the well, cases... Well, we did say, if you want to resolve it early, give us all your money. They weren't interested in doing that. They were interested in getting it resolved early before we knew that the driver was on cocaine. Be right, because they want to get the case resolved for what they want, right. not what you want. And you can't do that unless you know what the case is about. So I, I think one, one way to combat that is to say... All right, you know, if you want to mediate early, put $5 million on the table, and I'll see if my client wants to come, right? And that usually diffuses it. Well, we're not going to do that. Who does that? No lawyer's ever done that. Uh, yeah, a lot of lawyers do that. And I think it's very powerful because you're sending a message to them that this is what I think this case is worth, somewhere north of there, right? right? And, and or you don't have enough money. I know you don't. Don't waste my time. I'm not going on an early mediation for you to say, you know, I haven't looked at, I haven't had a doctor examine your clients, right? I don't have an econ. Right. And the other thing is just when, when you're forced to do it by a judge uh, or co-counsel or somebody else, right. don't get despondent when they give that low offer and start doubting your case or doubting yourself or, you know, right. don't get mad. It's just, it's part of the game. Right. It's, it's just what you said, and jo I think Joe Freed reiterated this earlier this week. It's just, you know, go to the mediation and say, you know, I think the case is worth all the money you have. Do you have any facts which suggest that I can take back to my client to convince me and the client why we think it's worth less, right? There's a, there's a way to do it that's not combative, unless combative is your style, right? Yeah, it's not mine. Nor mine. So I think that that's two ways to, to avoid the early mediation. Of course, the defense wants to get out in front of the case, and I think it's smart to do it, but it's not always right for the client. Pete, I've really enjoyed this, uh, taking, learning things I'm taking back and using my own practice. Hopefully our listeners are too. And uh, thank you so much for talking to us. Well, I appreciate you having me here. This oh, one last fun. thing. If somebody wants to find you or get a hold of you, uh, they may have a case they want to talk to you about or another follow-up issue. How would they do that? It's P. Kessner, K-E-S-T-N-E-R at McEwenLaw.com. That's M-C-E-W-E-N-L-A-W.com. 
or my direct dial, 651-888-7937. And his website and everything else is going to be in the show notes if you Just, want to look them up. Yes. Well, thank you, Michael. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you're listening to this episode on a mobile device, please click on Ratings and Review and leave our show a five-star rating and write a review. And if you're listening to this episode from our website, please leave a five-star rating on the episode page. We'd love to reach more listeners, and doing this will help more attorneys find this podcast. You can also visit our website at www.triallawyernation.com to opt into our mailing list so you can stay updated on our new episodes. I promise we won't spam you. And thanks to your feedback, we've improved our podcast website. There's now a resources tab that you can click that shows you all the books we've mentioned on our podcast. If you have a Facebook account, please send us a request to join our private group called Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle. This exclusive group will allow you to hear about our guests before an episode airs, interact with the show, and get a sneak peek at some of the behind the scenes moments. I love to hear from all of you, and our Table Talk episodes are based solely on questions from our fans. So please continue to send us emails at podcast at triallawyernation.com. Thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking, commercial motor vehicle, and product liability cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We would be honored to review the case in detail, discuss where we believe we can add value, and create a mutually beneficial partnership. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors.